Jaspers. High and deep. Way back. Goal! Juliana Zobrist is an author and an incredible songwriter. She's a performer. Ben Zobrist might be the most valuable piece to any team in the big leagues. incredible outfit I've ever seen in real life. People must walk up to you just crying, oh. wanting to hug you. Yeah. That makes us look way cooler than we are. <laughs> True That's story. Job. <laughs> you up. Good job. Can we welcome them to the house? Such an honor to have Ben and Juliana. Um, they, they showed up early yesterday, and uh, so great to uh, be able to not only have them at convocation, but uh, Ben uh, spent some time with the baseball team, by the way. The baseball team is in the president's box. Can we just thank them for just being here yeah. and joining us and being our kind of honored seating. spotlight. Is yeah. there nachos up there for them, too? There's no nachos, okay. man, no. But uh, thanks for spending some time with them. How, how was that experience yesterday? It was awesome. Uh, they're a great group of guys. Had some really good and tough questions for me. I hope it was a benefit to them. I, I felt encouraged and built up. So it was, it was th so thank you guys and thank you coaches for letting me do that. That was fun. Yeah, and then Juliana, you, you uh, last night got to pour into some of the uh, female leadership on campus there at the music hall and uh, it was just incredible to see how God used you. I heard from several students that some of the things that you had to say uh, were very timely. Um, we were sitting in the back of the room. We we're like the only two guys in the room and watching. And it was, first of all, it was fun to watch a husband just cheer his wife on. He was like, mm, amen, that's so good. And we were laughing. And, and then halfway through it, uh, he said, you know, this is the first time this, for, in this message. This is like a brand new one for her. Didn't feel that way at all. But thanks for coming and pouring into us already. H how did that go th for you last night? Well, I, I love you girls. Like you are my heart and my soul. Honestly, everything that I do, I do for these girls because we're the same and I really believe that we're in this together and we're struggling and walking and, and championing one another um, as best as we can. So if I could have just sat in the middle of all of y'all and just had you like circle around me, I would have done that. And I actually got invited to a pizza party. And I know, and I wanted so badly to go and then I forgot your stinking room number. So I was meandering around campus like a loser, but next time. <laughs> It was really fun. We had an amazing time. <laughs> That's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't go. You know why? Why? Because that would have been like showing favoritism. There's, who else would have lucked that pizza last night with Juliana? Yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't have been fair. Um, before we talk baseball and we talk life and marriage and all that, take us back. Tell us how you became a Christian. Tell us about your upbringing. Uh, before God ever put you in this particular world, uh, you know, as a professional athlete, uh, you felt a call to ministry in your life. And so t tell us a little bit about your testimony. Yeah, from a young age, I, I wanted to do the right thing. Um, so when I was taught about the Bible, taught about the gospel, I accepted and I knew that I didn't want to go to hell. So I accepted Christ out of fear of hell and, and believing um, the truth that God is a God of both judgment and love, you know, and, and mercy. So I understand that, stood that from a young age, but growing up in a, Bible church in a conservative Christian environment, um, that was one side of my life, but then I had this sports side of my life. You know, I loved sports so much that uh, I dove head, headlong into it, and I was very good at it, obviously from a young age, um, in, in more than just baseball, like basketball, I ran uh, ra road races, cross country, things like that, uh, played some football as well. and. I think early on in high school, I started recognizing that it was becoming an idol in my life, um, something that I really cared about and loved and was more passionate about in my life than the Lord. And later on in high school, um, I dealt with depression for the first time and started being afraid of the future and not sure. I lost confidence in myself, lost confidence in the Lord during that time, questioned a lot of things, wasn't sure what was going to happen in my future. And for those of you that have ever struggled with depression, uh, you know how dark of a place it is. I know there's some people here struggling with it right now. Um, I've dealt with it three different times in my life, and it's a, 
very, very difficult thing, but I'm being vulnerable to let you guys know that um, there is hope. No matter what, no matter where you're at, there is hope, and God loves you. And one of the things he's taught me through that, as I surrendered my life to the Lord, I surrendered sports to the Lord, I just said, okay, God, whatever you want, because I just don't want to be miserable. I've learned through the years that sometimes he takes us into those seasons to teach us things about ourselves, um, to, to keep us um, at his feet and remembering that he is in control. And he uses those things not just for our growth, but for the growth of those around us um, and also just know that even, even how dark it feels right now, that there is, God will do something with it if you let him. Just let him work. Let him uh, realize that it's not all your own issue. Um, yeah, there's, there's ways that God works in our hearts, and um, he wants to give us that 360 view of that issue and that struggle. And through that, he's, he's just shown me his grace so much. He's shown me how much he loves me and how he's using that to to bring self-awareness, how he's using that to, to help me to understand that I, I need him every day, and uh, it's an ongoing thing that I'm, I'm going to continue to tr try to trust him as I walk through this life. Uh, Juliana, you, you grew up a, a PK, a preacher's kid, but I'd love to hear some of your story and how you came to Christ and your upbringing. Yeah, I was um, number four of six kids, and I always had, yes, I always had a... Um, a strong bent toward anything mysterious, anything divine. I saw the face of God really in, and primarily in his creation. And looking back, I, I would have considered myself a naturalist at the time. I, I felt God's presence. I knew he was around me, especially when I was in creation. Um, but there was lacking a relational aspect to God, um, definitely a higher view of him, but I didn't know him personally. Um, however, I sang in church, and I was a great worship leader, <laughs> but I didn't know Jesus. <laughs> so, but being a pastor's kid, that's just kind of what you did. And um, I'll never forget being in a room much like this one, and I was with Third Day, and we're singing. And then we're supposed to go out into the streets of Chicago and tell people about Jesus. And I had this moment of awakening where I was like, girl, you're a liar. Wow. Like all this, all this that you're singing, you know, it, it felt like this paradigm shift for me. Like, you know who you are before God, but do you know who you are before Christ? And they're one and the same, but, but to recognize and see that I was playing so hard into this persona of, Christ of Christianity without actually realizing that I needed Christ. You know, I appreciated him. I appreciated his creation, but I didn't appreciate it for myself. And in that moment, I skipped out on the rest of the conference because I just, my integrity couldn't allow me to do something that I didn't believe wholeheartedly. But that began really my journey of discovering Christ and seeing his goodness on my behalf and, and realizing that, um, you know, when God says that you're created in his image, that that's really what I was seeing in creation. That's what I was seeing in other people was this imprint of God in us. But really the only reconciliation that we have is through Christ. And um, that moment, it was a singular moment, but that moment for me was when I was a sophomore in college. It's amazing how then um, from very different paths, you know, God brought you guys together. Um, and I want to, in just a few minutes, talk a little bit about marriage and um, being the parent of three kids and all that. But uh, can we just get right into baseball? I don't know that's your day job. By the way, he starts next week right back in. And so just as an active player, uh, what you're known for, even though you play for multiple teams and uh, everything, is having hit the single greatest hit in Cubs history. 108 years. Uh, that's a drought, man, where, uh, you know, the Cubs had not won. Talk about just a suffering fan base, right? Uh, I was in Chicago last summer. I, I, I met a guy who said, um, I'm a, he had a Cubs, he had a ball cap on. I met this guy, and, um, and we were talking about when they finally broke, you broke it with that hit. And, and he said, um, he said, the day the Cubs finally won the World Series, his father 
and his son and him went to see the, the granddad at his grave, they opened up a Bud Light and poured it over the grave and said, the curse has been broken. <laughs> and so, that's your fault. All right, so <laughs> let's watch this video and then I wanna ask you about that moment and what it felt like uh, to win the World Series and to be the MVP. Insane. Bro, I mean, the seventh game of the World Series, you know, tied game, it just like a dramatic, like a movie. And then instead of like folding, you were just so clutch. Take us through that moment. What was that like? Sheer panic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, he had me two strikes. He throws a 98 mile an hour cutter that moves really difficult to hit. And it was, it was an excuse me, hopeful swing. You know, um, I'd like to say I was so confident, I knew I was going to do it, but that's totally not true. Um, and, but God used it, you know, it's amazing. Like when, when that happened, I, I went to second base, you couldn't really see it in that clip, but I jumped up in the air, fist pump, like th that moment for me, baseball wise, is, is obviously the penultimate moment to do that for the Cubs and the 108 year thing and put us ahead in extra innings, seven, game seven, all that stuff was amazing you know, incredible. And by the way, I wore my ring in case you couldn't see it. <laughs> bling, bling. <laughs> I, I really never, don't wear it very often at all. Um, I did that for you guys. Um, but, and, and the Camaro that I won is sitting in the garage in a bubble cover. So um, I barely ever drive that too, trying to keep everything safe. You're trying to steal my ring, though. I know that. I want that ring, bro. I no, want that don't. ring. I feel like, you know, as a Christian, you should not let things own you. So <laughs> if you, <laughs> seriously, like, if you want to give it to me, um, uh, I, will, I will sell it on eBay and tithe 10% to glorify God. <laughs> and so pray that's about good. it. That's good. You don't want to not do that and then Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit, I, mean, I know that's rare for you, but he's got a lot of them. So next week he might just go, what's one more? Exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Take his. But that transitions, transitions us right in. You actually have another one as well. You're, you're one of seven players to win two in a row off two different teams. Uh, Kansas City Royals. Yeah. I see you down there, man. I see you. And then the very next year, you know, you, you, with the Cubs, of course. But uh, let's watch this uh, moment uh, when you get the MVP award. And then I want to ask you the differences between the two moments. So tell us about the two different moments. Yeah, uh, well, the, obviously the first one with Kansas City was incredible. I mean, we had never experienced something like that. So um, the whole city of Kansas City being um, behind us and, you know, a million people at the parade coming to Kansas. And there's only 500,000 in the city itself, you know. So people were coming from all over the Midwest to, to be at that one. And then you go to Chicago. I mean, and... There was seven million people at that parade, and um, the ring's a little bit bigger. You know, they, they do everything a little bit bigger in Chicago. So um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, we love Kansas City. We have this feel, both of us. And Julianne has been back like 20 times to like speak there. They're, everybody has been so kind and loving to us um, from that part of the country. And then Chicago's, you know, the same thing, just on a little bit bigger scale. So. It's been incredible in both regards, but it's hard for me to say one's better than the other. But one's, one ring is bigger than the other. There's no doubt. <laughs> it's got 108 diamonds in it, you were telling me? Yeah. 
108. You need to cast those crowns, bro. Just give it away right now. Give it to us. Uh, Juliana, uh, you are uh, an author, and I know you're a musician, and we'll talk a little bit about your music as well, but uh, tell us about this brand new book. Congratulations. By the way, all of our RSs received a copy of this book just as a gift last night, so a lot of them were going to be going through it, but uh, pull it off, removing your fears and putting on confidence. Tell us about the premise of this book and why you wrote it and you felt like it was important. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, as a musician, when I put out my last record, Shatterproof, I was traveling around and speaking on these concepts of um, fear and doubt and shame and just opening up to the women and the girls that I was talking to. And it was so interesting because after the shows, it didn't matter if it was a 12-year-old girl or like an 80-year-old woman, but the theme was the same in that we're all struggling with insecurity. We're all struggling with fear. It doesn't matter who you are. Fear doesn't differentiate. It doesn't, it, you know, you're not void of fear because of what's in your bank account or because you're a certain ethnicity or because of your gender. Fear doesn't distinguish between those things. And I think a message that we're fed right now is this message of fearlessness. And I found that for me, that message, while intending to be liberating, was actually really burdensome because I look around and I'm like, fearless? To, wait, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to get to a point where I don't have insecurity because I don't know anybody like that. You know, so it felt like this very vague kind of... Um, something to try and attain to that, that we'll never be able to attain to. So really the point of pull it off is let's reframe the way that we look at fear. Let's reframe the way that we look at insecurity. Less is something to avoid and more is something to catapult us toward our courage. And that's what was so fascinating in doing my research for the book is that courage, the part of the brain that fires when you're courageous, actually functions more like a muscle than it does as an organ in, the, in so much as when you exercise it, it gets stronger. So from the most basic cellular level, when you exercise your courage, when you see your fear, when you see your insecurity and you decide, I'm not gonna let it win, I'm actually gonna push through it to the other side, your brain gets stronger. And then the next day, when you're feeling insecure again, you do that again, you exercise your courage again and it literally gets stronger. So it was so liberating for me um, to begin to rethink the way that we look at insecurity. Not as like, oh man, I'm insecure and I need to hide that. Don't be a master of avoidance, but be a master at conquering these things. And all of that really comes back to this knowledge and belief of our worth before Christ. This worth that's been imprinted in us because of who God has said you are. That you're not a mistake, that you are intended, that you've been created in his image. And that really ultimately, that is that allows us to celebrate one another. That allows all of this right here, all 10,000 or however many of you there are, to be literally a walking representation of who God is because we're each like fractions of him, right? We each carry a different part of who he is. So it's a collaboration and it's not a competition and we can live in unity without requiring uniformity. But that doesn't happen unless you begin to just hold firm in who you are and be confident in the person that God has created you to be. Can you, yes, yeah, so good. Um, can you expound on that a little bit more um, as it relates uh, to courage, defining courage, that courage isn't not having fear, but what is it exactly? Yeah, courage is not the absence of fear. Um, to avoid fear is to avoid courage. When your amygdala fires and says, I'm afraid, your brain literally has this response saying, are we going to be courageous or no right here? So you have an opportunity always to look at your fear, to name your fear, to name your insecurity, to release it of its power just from saying that you don't have it, and then to press forward and to not let it beat you and to not let it define or... Um, really confine who you are as an individual. That for me has been the biggest way that I have seen it play out in my life, is releasing, um, releasing myself from those insecurities just to be myself. Like sometimes that's just the most courageous thing we can do, is simply be confident and courageous enough to step out into the world being who we are. And that's so special and important 
and necessary for the world to see because you are carrying that image of God that he has given to you specifically. So when you deny that and you adjust yourself to the culture or when you let fear win and you, you contain yourself to the confines of traditionalism or convention, then in a way you're sort of defining your own worth. You're discounting your own worth and your own value. And I just, I do believe that God is sitting up there going, no, 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 wait, no, stop. Don't be her. I made her her. I made you you, right? So it releases us from this competition, and that's been the most liberating thing for me. So biblically founded. That's so great uh, to, to just be affirmed in that. And I, I think um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the of beginning of wisdom, Proverbs tells us, which also can be read as the fear of the world is the beginning of folly. And so God's given us fear as a gift of discernment. Sometimes we, we walk in a room and we go, something's off. That's that, that's that way that God's designed us. But then it's humbling to know that God empowers us uh, to be able to conquer fears, not in our might, but in His might through us. You guys are two of the busiest people. I mean, you've got a full career, you know, with music and speaking and traveling, and then you with baseball, and then also the ministry that you do. How do you balance that, uh, if you even do, uh, and with three kids and all the different things that, that happen? Talk to us about just joining forces and finding rhythm in that and balance. Yeah, I mean, early on in our marriage, um, Juliana sacrificed so much of um, the things that she could have been doing um, just to be near me. And so that was early on was a really important priority for us to stay together as much as we could, um, make our family um, kind of the most prior, the, the biggest priority after our relationship with the Lord. And that meant, you know, career-wise, you know, we, we were going to do all the travel and, and do all that stuff together. So it's been very difficult. There's no, there's no um, denying that. It's, a, it's tough trying to do these two kinds of careers at the same time with three kids and all that, that gets added in. And we're still battling with that. We're still trying to figure that out um, going forward. But, but definitely just trying to make first things first priorities is, is important. Yeah, we're not perfect at it. <laughs> if anyone has any tips, we'll take them. Um, <clears throat> you know, people ask us this a lot about balance. And sometimes I'm like, well, balance is kind of boring. Seems boring to me. So I do think that there are times that in life where you might just be super overwhelmed right now with school, or you might just be heads in the books, you know, studying for something, and that's okay. You know, I think that what is important is maintaining this perspective that God has asked us to have, and really at the end of the day to stay true first and foremost to what God has put in front of you, your, you know, your family someday or whatever, but um, also to maintain persistent in your passions, which is what you're doing. So if your life feels a little off kilter, like ours often does, or a little imbalanced, which ours often does, I think that's okay. You know, there are seasons for everything. Yeah, but certainly, despite the fact that in this moment, you, you, it's not lifetime sustainable pace, the, 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 just no. at, at the rapid pace <laughs> you guys are both going. But in this moment, you still have to be strategic. Uh, tell them a little bit about the sixth day, uh, you know, thing that you guys have with your kids. Can you talk about that principle? Yeah, so when Ben first got drafted, we decided to implement what we call the six day rule, which means that we don't spend any longer than six days apart from one another. And that's not really like the golden ticket to a perfect marriage by any means, but it is for us just a foundation and it's a starting point for us to navigate our schedules off of. So his schedule can't really move. Um, he can't just decide to take random days off, but I can adjust my, my music schedule around his. So we, we literally sit down with both of our teams for like four hours every spring and we work through eight months, literally week by week. And we plan in date nights and we plan in when I'm going to be traveling with him and we plan in when I'm going to be on the road and where the kids are going to be. Um, and also just personally, I would add in that it's become increasingly more important to seek out these moments of solitude. You know, you realize that as your time gets pressed thinner and thinner, that it's even more important to step back and give yourself these moments to breathe and these moments to be alone with the Lord and to read and just, and, and, um, Refill your mind and your soul and on a different level. Ben, you were uh, 
telling me last night about how God's kind of shifted your perspective about um, being in this moment. Uh, you know, your, your baseball career is certainly uh, on the back end of it. You know, you're, you're, you're not looking for 20 more years of, you know, being on the road with a particular team. Uh, and instead of thinking about, like, what am I going to do next? There's this moment that God's given you. Can you tell us about what you've been learning in that? Yeah, yeah. I think over the course of my career, I've missed a lot of the present moment because I was so focused on the carrot in front of me, the next thing that I wanted to go get. And after that World Series victory that you saw part of right there, that took the last biggest carrot away from me, you know? I mean, what else do you want to try to do? So I still had three more years on my contract, and people are going, well, what are you going to do next? What's, what's next for you? Are you retired? You know, and I'm thinking about the same things, and I'm getting too far ahead, and that led me down a dark path again, you know? And so since then, the Lord is trying to help me stay in the moment, trust Him in the moment, not think too far ahead. Um, I do believe... When you're early in your life, it's easy for you to be thinking about what I want to get to, where I want to get to. And then when you're in a place like me, where I've kind of reached the pinnacle of my career, everybody talks about staying here, being right there, you know, like stay there, stay there, stay there. It's easy for me to tell you that right now, stay there. But when, you know, a few years from now, when I'm retired, and I'm going to be wanting to go, hey, look, remember I did this? Really important, right? And it's not so important. Nobody really cares all that much. Who's going to remember in 50 years that I did that? Probably none of you, you know? Um, and the reality is you want to go back at that point in your life. But where does God want us to be? Right here, right now. This is where the Spirit works, right here, right now for us, right? So if we, you guys all want to get somewhere, that's why you're here, you know? Liberty's helping you get somewhere. But remember that God wants to do a work in you right now, right here, and teach you things. Pay attention to that. Yeah. Totally, man. Even looking at yesterday, you know, just being in the moment with our baseball team and realizing that that's not like a prequel before you're in combo with everybody else or being in the moment last night. Or even before that, you were telling me uh, you, you needed a, a sports massage and you and the guy just basically had this long conversation about God and he ministered to you and you, and you were like, that might have been the highlight of this entire trip because that was the moment that God had predestined for you. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible thing to just to be in the here and now. I think when you're a college student, a lot of time you're thinking about the next thing, like what, what's the job? I, I, this is all a season of preparation, but really the journey is, is the value of it. Uh, so much of your music's about the journey. Can you tell us about um, just you as a musician, what you feel like um, songs can do in the life of somebody and why you use music uh, as a way to do ministry? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was a poetry writer ever since I was a little girl. There was this tree in my parents' backyard that I would often just hide out in. I was kind of a weird kid, but that's beside the point. We can go into that at a later time. <laughs> but I would just sit in this tree that overhung a, a little creek, and I would sit there and I'd write poetry and I'd sing out to God. I would sing out um, what was inside my heart, and I was a very shy kid, and so this, this way of communicating through song and through poetry was just very natural for me. It was the way to express my heart. It was the way to really make sense of my heart and what was going on in my head. So poetry just quickly became um, a springboard into music, and it was sort of the way that I could let my true colors show, you know, my true self come out from a young age for a shy kid, number four of six, you know, um, it was easy to hide in the shadows. So this was the way of sort of pushing me out. And music is such a profound instrument in my life because it's able to not just tap into lyrically what's happening, but emotionally what's happening. And that really can't be put to words. And um, the Lord often works like that in our hearts as well. So music and I have had this really sweet love relationship where it's just allowed me to, to say things that I might not normally be brave enough on your average Tuesday to say to a stranger, but I can say it through a song, you know? And so to be able to communicate something so deep um, in your heart as to these concepts of fear or these concepts of shame or not feeling like you're enough or just resting on God's promises and going, you got to come through. You know, I have found music to be this really um, 
really powerful instrument in my life to make sense of the moments that I'm in right now. And I've been very dedicated to not trying to butter up those moments, which is probably why I've never signed a record deal, because they're like, uh, could you add a little hope into that? Or like, um, could you kind of make that seem not as bad as it is? And I'm like, no, because there's just, just real commitment this real commitment to what you're in, the journey that you're on, the path that you're on, the moment that you're in right now. You know, God is not void of those moments. He doesn't need us to clean them up before he can use them. So why do we feel like we have to sing that way? So there's this real authenticity that comes out when you're just writing from a very raw place that's not defined by whether or not it's gonna be picked up on radio or whether or not you're gonna be signed by it, but just saying, I want to be as authentic and sincere and vulnerable with my heart as I possibly can, because that's what's going to communicate and really benefit and, and, and bond us together. So both music and baseball are just a, a, their means to an end, their medium, and, and you're using that to, to do things. I love that you're saying, um, I can say things sometimes in a song, it, it, under the cover of a song that can really, um, translate a message that I might not be able to have the boldness to say just in a regular conversation. Uh, it it, it uh, lends us right into this moment. We ask you to sing just one song for us. But before we do this one last song, um, would you uh, tell us what we can be praying for? This is always our last question for all guests. What can we be praying for you uh, about? And uh, we'll come back and pray, but uh, what's the prayer request? And then you'll sing a song and then we'll come up and close in prayer. But what's something yeah, going on? I, for me, it's, you know, in these last year, a couple years of my career, uh, I, I, I just want to focus on the glory of Christ. Um, and as I get to know myself and the things that I struggle with and the things that um, I need to grow in as I'm transitioning to, you know, this, these different roles, recognizing that my focus, I want my focus and the glory to be on Christ, not on me not on the things I've done, yeah. um, but really on the things he's doing, both in and through me. I, I, I hope that that's where I can go in the next couple of years. That's awesome. I would say for us and for our family, um, as he sort of transitions out of baseball and we kind of find our new normal, um, just for us um, yeah. together and for our children and for whatever God has in store for us in the future. Yeah, so just the renown of God and, and just clarity on direction. That's certainly be what we'll be praying for. But uh, don't you want to hear just one song from our sister? And uh, let's do this one song, um, and, then, uh, and then we'll pray together, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss. Thanks. Tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about the story uh, behind the song, if you don't oh, mind. Oh, yeah, I will. As you're getting up. Y'all, I'm sweating, so I'm just taking this off. Hi. Again. Hey. So this song is called Safe. And this is the most intimate song that I've ever written. And that it speaks to this very real moment when you know that maybe you've messed up or you know that you're not enough for God or you know that you haven't made the right choice, or you know that you let fear win. And for me, as I was writing this, it was just um, this profound realization that the beauty of the gospel is that even when you're at your lowest point, that you're still safe before God because of Christ, that he doesn't require you to be anything other than who you are. And sometimes that's the most courageous thing you can do is to be real about what you're struggling with, to be real about the journey that you are on. And I just want you to know that you are intended and that you are loved and that there is no path that you could take. There's no mistake that you could make. There's nothing that you could say that will ever separate you from the love of Christ because it's not up to you. It's up to him. And he's chosen you, and you are his child. And so you are safe in him.
Great job. Thank you, Juliana. Let's, uh, thank you. Let's pray. Let's pray for this couple. By the way, as soon as we dismiss, um, if you too want to wear the ring, all right, uh, Ben and Juliana are going to be in section 118. Uh, she has her CD and books, but Ben will let you wear the ring and take pictures with them, all right? So, cool. I should say the word like my precious or something right now, you know, like I got the ring. All right, let me, let me pray for this couple. Uh, Father, we thank you for, for Ben and Juliana, and, and we thank you, God, that in this season of their life, they really are using music and baseball and writing uh, to just um, advance, Father, your kingdom, to, to reveal your truth to people. We pray for them, Lord. We pray uh, for protection over their marriage, provision, God. Uh, they've got the money thing figured out and the fame thing figured out. We just pray for protection over uh, those who would come against them, those who would try to come between them. We pray for longevity, God, in their marriage. They wouldn't just start well like they have, but they'd finish well. Every day, God, we see people just um, put to the sidelines because of sin that's crept in. So have them, God, seek first the kingdom of God and, and then everything else at a distant second. We pray for your glory, God, uh, to be made known in and through everything that they do. I pray that today they'll know that they're among family here, that we're for them anytime we see them anywhere on TV or just flipping channels on ESPN, that we'll, we'll, we'll know to just stop and pray for this family, pray for their kids. 
We love you, God. Thank you that we have the greatest commonality and that we have you. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you. Hey, one more time. Let's give them a hand. There'll be a section 118.